Welcome, uh, my name is Mark Zimmermann. I'm a digital artist from Dresden here in Germany and I will tell you a bit about my experiences uh, with pre-rendered cinematic VR using Cinema 4D and After Effects. So I will tell you a bit about my work in general and then about my project Longing for Wilderness and Conscious Existence and give a quick summary of uh, some of the best practices or experiences that I have made uh, with pre-rendered VR. Okay. So I graduated from the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg uh, in 2015 and I'm now working as a freelance digital artist with a focus on digital environments, matte painting, visual effects, and I'm creating this for movies and commercials. And as much as I can, I try to create personal projects, um, be it still artworks or short films. And my tools of choice are Cinema 4D and After Effects. Uh, this, for example, was my graduation project um, that I did 2015 at the Film Academy and I will just show you a quick uh, snippet of that so you can get a feeling uh, of what I like to do with Cinema 4D. You can watch the whole f uh, short film on Vimeo <laughs> because we don't have so much time now. Okay. Um, so my thing is to, is it to um, use digital environments to um, express emotions, concepts, feelings um, with the help of uh, digital environments, and which in some way then will become the protagonist. I also did that in my second and third year uh, projects, uh, Start Watching and Inner Space. And yeah, you can also watch those short films on Vimeo if you like. So why virtual reality? I think um, if I try to convey emotions or feelings with the help of environments, then I think it's kind of a logical step to try 360 or VR to immerse the viewer into my creations so that they are really in the video or in the experience itself. And my first endeavor in that kind of 360 realm was uh, longing for wilderness. And uh, this one was inspired by my own fascination for wild and airy landscapes and um, expresses like the desire to um, escape the everyday turbulences and noise and in, in this case go from the noisy city into the um, wilderness um, and calm down and just switch off your mind. And this one was um, uh, still in mono, so a 360 video, um, also with uh, High, higher frame rate and spatial sound and three minutes and yeah I took me it took me four months to create it and I will um, 
show you now a 2D crop version of it. You can also um, watch a 360 version of that on Vimeo or and there's also a link where you can download the whole film if you like to want to uh, view it on a headset in high quality. Oh, no. This one. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So the first thing that I did for this film was to create this uh, like visual timeline to um, get a feeling for the mood and the color that changes over time. So that was my starting point for this film. And this is the whole world um, in Cinema 4D. Um, but the the whole geometry was never visible at the at one time in in the film um, because uh, at some points it got got very complex. So um, one thing that I did was to just uh, animate the visibility of the individual sections and object groups, um, which is pretty straightforward. Um, but I also um, like parented a plane effector to the camera and assigned that to all cloners in the scene for the vegetation. So the scene um, far farther away in a certain radius would always be switched off and that would make the scene lighter and faster to render. So kind of like in a in the game engine but um a bit bigger in scale so you really don't see any popping or something like that. And yeah I love to use the sculpting tools of Cinema 4D which uh, I think are really handy and I needed there to create the terrain. I like to use MoGraph to scatter my vegetation, like here, and then to add some randomness and gaps. And I like to use Turbulence FD to create the atmosphere, and because you can get some nice kind of uh, sun rays going through the foliage uh, this way. And that's like the 3D part of that end scene. And I also like uh, the MoCraft system to cheat dynamics a lot. For example, here with the rubbish, with the waste that's flying around, um, I used um, a chain of effectors, like here, 
a plane effector that pulls it into the z-axis, then a random effector that kind of uh, randomizes the position next and um, lifts it up, kind of, that's the plane effector, and um, then another effector that scales it to zero at a certain distance. And the workflow for this piece, um, there was no thing like the CVVR cam plugin or something around, and um, I wanted to create this one in mono, so I um, did a six pack camera setup in Cinema 4D and rendered six 1K images per frame. Assembled that as a cube map in After Effects and converted each pass to the spherical format with the Skybox converter from Metal. And then I balanced the passes, added the effects, and previewed with the Skybox Viewer, and rendered the f uh, final spherical 4K image, and then previewed the encoding with the VR player on PC, or at that time with a cardboard with, with my phone. And you can see, for example, um, like the raw passes from Cinema 4D um, added over another. And uh, this is some atmosphere and compositing applied, um, but without any effects that use like blur and glows. I will come to that a bit later. And this is like the final compositing. And this is the view that you will get in the headset, kind of approximated. So that's the 3D part. That's the matte painting that I uh, created for this scene, added to the scene. And then blur, glow, all of kind of adjustments, and here's a crop of what you kind of might see in the end. For the um, buildings in the city, I did them really rough because they were quite out of focus. So that's uh, some pictures I took in Dresden, and um, yeah, just really uh, simple extruding geometry, and that's the scene without compositing the raw rendering. And some atmosphere, lots of compositing, and here you can see it's a good example that it's kind of hard to judge the brightness of the image um, in this spherical format because the top and the bottom they take a lot of space in the image and it's not really representative. So if you crop in, you get a much better feeling for uh, how dark or how how much effects you can apply so that it looks uh, good and not not too dark. That's another scene, atmosphere, compositing, and the cropped view. So in general, my workflow is quite compositing heavy. I like to use lots of 2D and 2.5D tricks, which uh, in the spherical format are often not or harder to use. For example, if you want to place uh, footage or elements on cards and place them in 3D or 2.5D space and then add a camera movement to that, that kind of gets really tricky. You can achieve that with the uh, Metal plugins or now with the uh, new After Effects version, um, but it's uh, not really straightforward. So I tend to do more stuff in 3D than in, in a normal uh, 2D films. Then all effects that need their enable pixels in order to be computed correctly, like rec focus, blurs, glows, um, they kind of need some special treatment so you don't get a seam at the um, where the image, the spherical image gets uh, wrapped together again. Um, you would need some kind of dedicated 360 filters, which now in the new uh, After Effects CC 2018 are uh, included, some of them, like uh, VR blur. Um, but for me, I still uh, like to use my own workaround um, because um, um, I didn't have the new version, of course, when I worked on that. And I'm using a render farm to compute the images, and there's not uh, not all plugins available. So I like to use like the built-in uh, solutions that are possible. So here you can see. Um, the the passes itself and after effects then i will always like extend the composition can you see it here yeah um then apply all the effects that needs blurs and glows and that need their neighbor pixels and then crop it again and that way it does not look this you can see a visible seam there 
but this. So that's uh, something you need to do if you want to apply those kind of effects. And also uh, masks that you want to continue uh, on the other side. Um, I just did a really simple thing. I just don't apply the mask to the uh, layer itself, but create a solid, apply the mask there, and use an offset effect. And then with some, you can get used to that kind of workflow. And for the most cases, it, it will be fine. Then, for example, that kind of um, galaxy time lapse effect. For this one, um, I used this uh, uh, Milky Way picture from NASA and um, converted that with the Skybox converter and also animated the axis. Then put an echo effect over that and pre-rendered this whole thing and used that as a reflection um, also at the sky and also as a reflection to, so that it's visible in the puddles that are there at the ground. So I will show you a quick video where you can see all of that in motion a bit clearer. You <laughs> make my desire come true. Okay, <laughs> full full body. Uh, it's okay. Um, this was the installation that we had of the FMX in 2016 with a wind machine under the desk and uh, Oculus Rift and Subpack. Uh, spatial sound and the sub pack I'm also using for conscious existence my next next project because it's uh, like a really handy tool I think um, to for example in longing for wilderness to convey speed using kind of non periodic rumble but you can also like use periodic vibration more musical frequencies which give a whole different feelings can for example cause goosebumps if you use it right and yeah it's a very cool and creative tool and but the low end frequency, the low end of the, the sound design music uh, needs some special treatment, which uh, I think is a lot of fun <laughs> to, to do the sound design music as well. Okay, conscious existence. 
So uh, this project was uh, part of the VR Now initiative of the uh, Animation Institute, um, which allowed me as a graduate uh, from a school in Film Academy, uh, from a school of Baden-Württemberg, uh, to use uh, their resources, uh, for example, the render farm, in order to compute the images of uh, that project. And the idea for this project was uh, already anchored uh, or visible in my earlier projects. Um, for example, the inner space one where there's a sound source traveling through the ear canal and through all those organs in your ear to the brain and you see that it causes there like a colorful galaxy, like the emotions that the music carries with them. Or uh, this still that I did that kind of uh, shows the the universe that forms life and life that forms consciousness as like its biggest achievement in some way. And with that consciousness, um, this can be nourished by nature, uh, which is like a, a strong point in most of my works. Uh, for example, you can see here, if you look closer, maybe uh, something more than just uh, nature scenery. I love like this kind of contemplative uh, works where you might see more uh, when you look uh, at it a bit longer. And then the concept of the conscious mind that's like given to us as a gift and uh, enables us to sense all the beauty of the world around us and then um, to use that energy to retain well-being in our inside. So, based on all of these influences, I created this key sentence for the film. We are gifted every moment with life's most precious achievement. A conscious mind enabling us to sense and hold within us the universe's boundless beauty. A source of infinite inspiration that fuels our inner space. And from all that input, I created a voiceover text. Um, which was, um, for me, the starting point for this film. You remember for Longing for Wilderness, I did this visual timeline as a starting point, and for that it was a, a text. Um, and um, I also recorded the text for myself, so I had a base for um, like the animatic and the music and sound design that I could flesh out and iterate on and get a feeling for the timing. Um, I can play a quick snippet of what I recorded there. A conscious mind enabling you to sense and hold within the universe's boundless beauty. Okay, so it's a really slow a pacing. Conscious mind. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, Again, the question, why virtual reality? I think for this film, VR is the perfect fit because the goal is to enable the viewer to mentally drift and uh, like transcend into a relaxed, appreciative state of mind. Um, also be kind of amazed from, from the beauty, of course, that's the goal. And to achieve that, um, we need maximum immersion and separation from the viewing environment to really get into a, like a meditative state of mind. And a plus is also like the, the intim intimacy of the voiceover is much more um, present uh, in VR if you have, wear headphones and have some binaural sound. Stereoscopic uh, depth information, high frame rate playback, spatial sound, tactile based feedback, it all adds to the immersion. That's why VR is the perfect fit for me for that project. I'm using, um, to tell that story, I'm using abstract visuals to like reflect um, our state of mind and um, our mindset that influenced um, by, the, by the world around us and also fantastic visuals that shows our inner space and the gift of consciousness and also that kind of hyper real or stylized um, kind of visuals where I show uh, like a little visual firework of the beauty 
of the world that we can use as a source of energy and inspiration. And now I will show you a trailer for the film itself. You can make this one a bit louder. We begin slowly. Feeling safe. And now gradually, the ship of life picks up pace. Artificially raised. Break through the dust that makes you blind. You are gifted every moment with life's most precious achievement in conscious mind, enabling you to sense and hold within the universe's boundless beauty. can see or you could hear that's not my voice in the end anymore but it's uh, the voice of cute little Helen from the US um, we recorded that in a very short amount of time and with an iPhone and an external mic and with the help of her mom and uh, Anna Monte from Delta Sound and yeah it was a little uh, adventure <laughs> and I think she did a good job Okay, in general, I try to use the minimum amount of software package where possible. So my main packages, again, Cinema 4D, After Effects, and the plugins for Cinema is the Turbulence FD and x particles that I use a lot. And for music and sound design, I use Ableton Live, which is for me kind of the Cinema 4D of sound, because it's very intuitive but powerful at the same time. And I'm using FFmpeg for the encoding, which I will tell you a bit more about later. My workflow for this film was that I would create uh, like 1K OpenGL previews from the front direction in order to uh, flesh out the animatic and iterate the music and sound design so that I could do iterations really quickly. Then I would render out equi rectangular stereo preview uh, in one video. Um, really like a, a rough rendering uh, using the progressive uh, mode uh, with two passes. And then I would do a slap comp on that in After Effects and preview this with the uh, Metal VR player in my Oculus Rift uh, to check the speed and the stereoscopic depth of the image. And uh, when I was satisfied with that, I would render a few passes, uh, a few frames of uh, in multipass high quality for left and right separately, um, because I would do the balancing of the multipasses and adding the effects um, only on one eye, and then just switch out uh, the the files for the other eye. And to make sure this works, I um, didn't use any sharp masks, so uh, the stereo effect wouldn't like hurt the eyes or something. And um, if I would use want to use like very defined and sharp mask, I just do soft masks on the object buffers of the objects, so that way you can also make uh, distinct areas um, and treat them differently. And um, yeah, all the stereo options uh, that you have in VR uh, really have to be decided in 3D. You cannot really uh, tweak um, the stereo effect meaningful in, in compositing anymore like you can with 2D footage. So there's no kind of convergen, uh, convergence of the eyes. Um, it's just like the eye distance that really makes the, the difference here. And yeah, if I like that, I would render the final 4K image sequences of the multipass image um, and do some more comp iterations, uh, mostly two to four times, and do some quick encoding tests with the Adobe Media Encoder and preview this on the Rift with uh, external players like DUVR or Whirligig. 
and later I would combine this um, to a 4K by 4K 16-bit uh, or 32-bit image sequence and do the final encoding with FFmpeg. So one example scene that I did for the project was this fern sample scene where the plants kind of unfold in a time-lapse kind of manner. And you can see here the, the camera rig um, which has six preview cameras for the individual directions and I always add a seventh camera um, which enables me to look around and uh, with a protection tab, uh, tag uh, with the position locked but the rotation uh, unlocked. And um, yeah, basically the most important value here is the eye separation um, which you um, yeah, have to kind of find a good uh, compromise for so that the stereo effect is big enough uh, but there's nothing as close so that it hurts your eyes so you see this kind of indicator here that uh, you should avoid objects to be placing in but you can go further than this uh, for example for the ground it's not that important that it's uh, outside that region but for this um, I wanted to feel the plants for example like really big and we kind of like small so the, the eye distance is also a bit smaller here and the, the region. Um, yeah, I show you a quick uh, video of that scene and the making of. That's this one. So this is the asset. So my goal for the most scenes uh, of this project was to create one asset um, that I can then get the most out of and rest the scene and um, like uh, cache this and uh, do like only time offsets and use like this one offset, uh, this one asset for for dressing the scene. And um, in this case. Um, the, the unfolding was, of course, the, the, the hardest part. And um, the way I did this, I created a bone chain that I animated. Um, and then I created from this uh, uh, the, the spline for the main stem. And um, the spline was uh, generated via Expresso from the bone chain. And on that stem, I attached those secondary leaves uh, with a cloner. And the question was how to unfurl, not like every leaf at the same time, which is easy, but to unfurl it from the bottom to the top. And the way I did this was um, it created a, a shader effector with an animated gradient and used the modify clone setting uh, set to 100. And then I have those two states of the leaves, so the curled one and the straight one and which are assigned as two clones of the, uh, like one row of, of those smaller leaves. And then using the shader effect to, to transition between those two clones. And this only works if uh, the poly count, the bone count, and all the deformers um, under that are the same and ha or have the same input fields so that uh, the attributes can be used to transition. So it's not only using the geometry trans to transition, but also the animated bones and all the, the values from the uh, deformers that are under that clone. And yeah, as I said, um, it was important for me to bake it. One thing was um, because on the render farm it would uh, cause a lot of jumps, this set up because a lot of deformers and deformers and effectors, bones and the expression that's driving this uh, main stem spline. And I want to dress and uh, time and iterate all the assets uh, in the scene in a fluent way. So this setup is really slow in itself. 
And a simple Alembic export was not possible because of those uh, expressions and deformers. It would always just beg a part of it and uh, not the way I wanted. So um, first thing I did, I baked uh, the splines that were created with the expressions. I put that whole setup into a connect object, created a merged copy of that that you can see here at the bottom. And um, create a correction modifier on the same uh, hierarchy and assigned a point cache tag to that, calculated that cache, uh, that point cache tag, and then dragged this tag onto the merged copy of the whole setup, which I then um, exported an Alembic of. And why not just use it with the point cache tag? Because um, I want to uh, offset the copies of the of the cache in time, which you can do with the point cache tag, but the small project size gets bigger with a lot of copies, even if you uh, do like an external cache file. But I, I, don't, I don't know if it's some kind of bug or if it's intended, but the scene gets bigger and bigger even with the external cache of the point cache tag. And also Alembic um, reads much faster than the point cache tag. That's why I did this workflow. So here you can see there's like 15 copies of that Alembic cache offset in time, which I then grouped uh, in, in different uh, variations under cloners in order to create uh, yeah, different plants with three and with five leaves. And this way I can get lots of variation and flexibility with only one cached asset. Then next example is uh, this kind of crystal cave. I wanted to to grow them, the crystals to grow out and uh, create kind of a magical feeling. And I will show you a video of that first. So for this scene, I didn't need any caching, which was good. Um, I used the, the most spline in the turtle mode and animated the growth of the, of the uh, most spline. And I couldn't, as you can see, I couldn't animate it in a linear way because the, the growth value kind of has some breaks if you uh, do it in a linear way. So I have to include some jumps actually to make it a smooth movement. Um, yeah, the whole thing is then put into a sweep object. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Then another example is the spider webs that you also saw in the trailer. Um, this was the base. I created this with a little plugin called PY Spider Web Generator, which you can, uh, where you can use nulls and place them in the uh, 3D space, and then it will generate. Um, based on a few attributes, the kind of web structure that you want. But I wanted to have like um, those hanging kind of uh, webs, which are wet from and, and soaked from the drops. And as you can see here, uh, um, all those uh, segments are separate. And if I would have, for example, apply some dynamics to that, it would all fall apart. So the way I did it here was um, to subdivide the whole thing once. Then the middle point that um, was created from that subdivision, I pulled that one down. Um, then I did a chamfer on that point, subdivided the whole thing again, and then pulled the, the whole map web down with an FFD object. And for the animation, I created a displacer that would uh, give it some kind of wobble, windy movement. Um, yeah, 
this was not enough for me. I think uh, if, if I look at this uh, in, in VR, in the headset, there's a lot of uh, thin and high contrasted lines, um, which is not so pleasant to look at, and it's also missing some kind of visual interest. That's why I did something that you shouldn't do in, in VR, which is use like depth of field and chromatic aberration stuff. Um, but I think I needed it here and it looked much better than without it. And uh, here I used uh, just a 2D turbulence in After Effects to create the camera lens blur with a very defined bouquet. So you do it that it gets kind of blurred, not as sharp, but still um, the, the sharpness is retained with the, within the circles of the uh, bouquet of the effect. And then um, at the same places, um, there's the displacement of the individual RGB channels to create some chromatic aberration there and it looks much more interesting that way than without, I think. I can show you a quick video of that one too. Another example is a fish swarm that I wanted to go up in a kind of spiral manner and then encircle the camera. And I tried like flocking behavior with X particles and um, other stuff, but this didn't really give me uh, what I wanted because like the, the flocking and um, follow spline things in X particles, I think are not quite there yet for me. Um, so what I did was I created a sphere and wrapped this around this um, helix and um, put also some more displacement on it and then animated the offset of the spline wrap which gives me this kind of uh, lines or trails and then I spline wrapped my fishes onto that. Um, later I switched them out with high quality assets and as you can see here the whole tracer object which was created by that sphere um, was converted as a uh, like the, the whole path. It's not only the small uh, spline uh, segments but it's the whole path uh, converted and then the fishes are spline wrapped to that only to a really small section, so they are not stretched out, and then the offset of the spline uh, wrap is animated. And there's uh, some additional displacements uh, in world space to make them wobble a bit, and yeah, also a band deformer that uh, moves the tail. Yeah, video. Yeah, that's that. Okay, and another example is this polar light scene. And of course the main asset is the polar lights itself. And the way I created those was um, with uh, this kind of uh, turbulences on disks that I used to uh, create inverse volumetric light with uh, spotlights. And if you look at it at this from the top, it looks like uh, yeah nothing <laughs> really. And um, also from the side, yeah, it's a bit more. Uh, but from the right kind of angle, um, it gives me what I wanted. And um, this RGB kind of thing uh, enables me to like split split the um, lights and use that uh, to color it in compositing. And when I was satisfied with that. 
So I, I, I rendered this, composited the polar lights, and then pre-rendered this whole sequence and took it back into Cinema 4D to use it as a reflection map. Because if I would use the um, volume lights itself as a reflection, there's much higher render times and it doesn't really make a difference uh, visually. Right. Why do I use physical render? That's a question that I often get. Um, as opposed to the standard render, of course, um, it gives me faster feedback, better looking specular's, and the correct motion blur that I, for example, needed for Longing for Wilderness. And in previous projects, uh, I used post motion blur in After Effects, for example, for natural attraction, which doesn't work uh, very well um, on, in a spherical format. Um, especially if you use uh, fast camera movement, detailed vegetation, but you probably know that. And as opposed to other renderers, I think it's uh, in lots of cases faster than um, unbiased renderers because I never use GI or depth of field with that and without it, it's I think it's quite a fast. It's great to cheat with, like with for example with the backlight shader or inverted ambient occlusion. I love to use the Cinema 4D noises for shading and um, I love to use Turbulence FD and uh, the look of the Turbulence FD with the standard renderer or physical renderer is much better I think with uh, some third party renderers that are able um, to, to render uh, the Turbulence FD. It works good with the CVVR cam and um, yeah and one way would be like to render like the geometry of the scene with another renderer and then render the turbulence of D with the native renderer. But um, in the spherical image format, it's kind of difficult to combine those two because there are different methods, uh, for example, for the poles of the image. Um, lots of renderers uh, handle those differently and then it will not match exactly, which would be bad. Then no crashes, like a lot of lots of plugins, uh, course, which is important, of course. I tried, for example, Arnold, um, which gives me a lot of fireflies and high render times uh, with glossy reflections um, when using uh, the spherical cam. Octane um, had no camera motion blur with the spherical cam, and it doesn't have a correct uh, depth pass in 360. It's only in one axis, but I need it in, in all directions. Um, the turbulence of D-Luck that I mentioned. And if I would do another project like this again, I probably use Redshift. Um, when I started with the project, it was still an alpha phase, so no uh, volume support, etc. But uh, I think this one is very promising. And of course, it um, it's more independent when using a render farm which has like limited licenses or the missing plugins. Okay. Um, encoding is a very important part for VR video, especially with the content that I create, which has a lot of low-key scenes, slow transitions with gradients, small structures, high detail, or fast object movements. You can see here on the left, which is my master format, the, ro the, the red um, region is what you will see in the headset. And then if you scale that down to the recommended uh, resolution of the Gear VR, for example, it's get, it gets even uh, smaller resolution. And if you scale this up, it's the artifacts that you will create with encoding are right into your face. So they are more, much more visible than with normal 2D video. Um, for example, like the blurry uh, B and P frames of the encoding, motion blocks, 8-bit banding, and uh, other color conversion artifacts. So it's recommended 
to always uh, use the highest spatial resolution resolution possible of course for the maximum sharpness um, also for the minimum amount of aliasing effect if artifacts uh, due to rescaling um, with thin lines for example and with a fixed resolution the perceived sharpness mainly depends on the bitrate but also on the encoding method itself, um, which determines, for example, the proportion of the I, B and P frames, the deblocking and the motion estimation, which is sometimes really important. And it's recommended to always use the slowest methods or pre uh, presets that you can tolerate. But for example, uh, deep blocking takes a lot of time but you shouldn't use too much of that because it removes the blocking artifacts of the H.264 format, but it also will blur it a bit again. So it's you have to find a compromise. It's a bit of a yeah, trial and error. And also the encoding tools that are available differ quite a bit in their usage and also the results that they can produce. For example, here is um, one image source cropped um, it has the same kind of uh, noise level, the same bitrate approximately. And you can see if I use the Adobe Media Encoder um, with one pass vari variable bitrate method, then you can see noticeable uh, banding artifacts. And uh, with FFmpeg, the same bitrate but a uh, different method. Um, you can, uh, which is not available at the Adobe Media Encoder, you can produce much uh, nicer results at the same kind of bitrate. And you might say that uh, exposure plus five, you will never see that, but um, if it's right in front of your face, you will see it. <laughs> then another thing um, is like, if I, for example, use FFmpeg, and use the variable bitrate uh, method. Um, then you have uh, this kind of iframes and B frames. Um, the iframes are like the the keyframes of the encoding, and the B and P frames are like frames that are based on that. They they don't stand for them alone, but they uh, will be calculated based on the iframes. And you can see on the left it's an iframe, on the right um, it's a blurry B frame and. If you do this variable bitrate method, then the image will always alternate uh, between the iframes and it get blurrier and blurrier and blurrier with each frame and then on the next frame jump again to a sharp iframe and which is really annoying in, in VR. Um, and that's something that I get with this method with FFmpeg. That's why I use um, the CRF method, which is constant rate factor which makes sure that the image always matches a certain quality uh, that corresponds to a number that you enter, a quality level. And um, so not a fixed bitrate, but a fixed quality. And um, that's not enough. Also, the same encoding can differ quite a bit on different devices. Uh, for example, on the S8 with the Gear VR, which applies some built-in video filters like sharpening and it crops the plaques, um, it can, the same encoding can look quite different. Here it's um, a bit exaggerated, so you can see it on the beamer, um, but you can see that the, the blacks are cropped at a certain level and all the artifacts um, around that region will get pronounced uh, very much. And it's not dependent on the display of the of the phone, but it's like some uh, built-in video filtering because if I use some third-party players on the same device, it looks exactly like on the PC, so it's kind of a player thing that I built into the VR mode of the, of the phone in order to optimize it. Um, so this make, it makes it much harder to encode low-key content for that device, for example, but um, you can find a way around it. And um, I, for example, raise the black levels above a certain threshold, um, and then it, it works OK. So it crops the blacks. Artifacts are much more pronounced. But if you tweak the video, the same video uh, can, on a mobile phone, look much sharper and much more fluent at 60 FPS than with any player that I tried at the PC. Uh, with the Rift, um, which I found very interesting. Um, but you still have the smaller field of view of the Gear VR headset, of course. 
Um, both systems, um, interestingly, um, PC and uh, like the S8 phone, for example, are able to play back an encoding at uh, 4K by 4K resolutions at 60 FPS with like 200 megabytes of peak. Um, on the phone, it's only possible with the Oculus video player, but you can see that these devices can really handle those high bit rates, which I found very cool. Um, and on the PC, it was open soon. Only certain players also that, that would uh, support it and would play it fluently. Um, for example, a DOVR or Whirly Gig. And because I think they use some smart hardware acceleration, um, which other players don't. Um, but the most fluent experience I got really on the Samsung phone, which was interesting. So my approach for this project was to raise the black levels, um, also for the PC version, because um, interestingly, you get less notable, noticeable bending artifacts, even though that's kind of against the logic because you're uh, constraining the range of the colors a bit. But um, I think the uh, H.264 uh, encoding um, is kind of, it sucks at the really dark levels. And if you raise it a bit, uh, it kind of has it does a better job. Why? I don't know. Um, yeah, I applied some noise and uh, it's important that you don't apply like a standard 2D noise, but also a 360 converted noise so that it doesn't get stretched at the poles. And um, the noise is, you can of course only apply a certain amount of noise in, in stereo, um, but it's less visible um, than in mono. Uh, that's something that I uh, saw because the noise gets averaged between the two eyes. And if you look the same video in uh, mono and stereo, com compare it in stereo, it's less noticeable. So this all gives me an increased file size and the blacks are not exactly black, but for me it was uh, the best compromise in order to avoid artifacts um, and use the same encoding on multiple platforms. So that's kind of the, this kind of the method method that I used FFmpeg with the CRF at the slowest preset, and then specify some values with the max rate and buff size. If you want to know more about that, you can uh, contact me later. And a nice thing is that the sound can be added added later with FFmpeg without re-encoding the video. Um, some stuff that I noticed for me, which were good practices are, or experiences. Um, the first thing is pretty much straightforward. It's not possible to just let a, a simulation, uh, a crop a simulation or let objects go off screen. Um, that um, makes for a much higher scene complexity, uh, simulation and render times. And if you compare uh, the render times of a normal 2K flat image versus the format, master format that I used, um, you have 16 times higher render times for one second of film. So uh, that's why I needed a render farm. Um, some image effects like vignetting are not possible or of limited use in the spherical format. Uh, for example, motion blur, chromatic aberration, out of focus effects. But I think they still should be considered as creative tools in some cases. And I think it's best to don't stick to the rules, but try for the individual case uh, what works, what not, what looks good. Uh, camera movement, of course, is very limited um, um, unless it uh, until it causes sickness, um, so the speed and also the acceleration. And for um, longing for wilderness, for example, it was the question: Should the uh, camera stay tangential to the movement of the path, or just at a fixed rotation? And I decided that it would be better to leave the camera rotation alone because the viewer will automatically adapt into the direction of travel and this avoids motion sickness. If you rotate the camera, this is kind of a weird feeling. So that way, if you cannot really rotate the camera, of course you have a limited ability to direct uh, attention with framing. So you have to find new uh, possibilities. Uh, one is, for example, the spatial sound that you can use as a creative tool to direct attention and um, yeah, 
tell the story or make the viewer look where you want, it, want him to look. If camera movement is needed, then rapid speed changes should be avoided and either use a constant speed or if it should be accelerated, then use a slow acceleration. Um, continuous experiments is uh, always better than hard cuts. That's something that uh, that's important, I think. And if necessary, do uh, long fades. Slower pacing is uh, kind of straightforward. Uh, you, you need much more time to discover everything that's around you in 360 than you would need with a normal 2D video. But of course, it should not be too slow. Uh, um, you should kind of have a story beat uh, every few seconds that grabs the attention of the viewer. Um, because the only kind of action or interaction, if you want to call it, is uh, to uh, change the view of, of uh, the user. Um, so you, you should kind of uh, grab the attention of, of the user uh, at, uh, in some intervals because this will keep him close and involved and immersed. If he just keep, keeps looking straight, then he might uh, also like be reminded of his phone at some point or something. But if he's busy, then uh, that's always good. Um, higher frame rate is always more comfortable. Um, and it's very important to view it in high frame rate early on to avoid surprises because um, the travel speed and also like the accuracy of animation really is really uh, different uh, perceptually if you would in high frame rate and um, for example the fishes uh, it's it feels much different in higher frame rate and um, sometimes uh, stuff can feel more fake if you uh, uh, don't animate it correctly and it gets only visible in the higher frame rate version perspective can be a really creative tool close to the ground can make you small f uh, feel small and uneasy and um, floating above uh, the ground of course can make you feel more relaxed and comfortable and there are even more possibilities with stereo of course to uh, scale the scene perceptually and grab attention like with nose picking stuff that comes close to you but it should also not come too close because then your eye uh, can't focus anymore and that's good for for like smaller things like particles that's okay but uh, for bigger more important things that uh, should be avoided then even in, in silent moments um, it's important to have some kind of ambient sound if you have like a, a black image it's good um, to have still something there so that the viewer is not thrown back into uh, reality. Then particles is a really good tool uh, to give the image more depth and more visual interest. And particles in VR, they look always good. <laughs> uh, pay special attention to encoding. And one of the most important tips, I think, is render as sharp as possible. Um, you need to change the filter size of uh, the uh, anti-aliasing settings. Um, even if you use physical render um, to a much smaller value, otherwise you will never get to a sharp image. You can apply sharpen in the post, but it uh, makes a lot of difference if you uh, decrease that filter size. So where can you see the experience itself? Um, it will be in VR cinemas and in, uh, on an online platforms uh, starting June 1st. I still cannot say where exactly, but it will be announced. And if you have the time, you can uh, see it here on the FMX at the booth of the Animation Institute. And I should uh, a few minutes ago have posted this post. And you can just comment with one of those numbers on the post and register your seat if you haven't seen it already. And then you can see what I was talking about. Um, I think I will skip this one because we are at the end. Yep. Um, for me, it was the question uh, pre-rendered real time, uh, which is a, a big question, but uh, I can talk about uh, that more if you're interested uh, personally. And for now, I want less of this and more of this. Thank you. <laughs>